the idea now is uh, that we said, okay, uh, we focus more or less on uh, the execution model that this all happens in a centralized way. Yeah. So, so we say we have one one chain, uh, we have one state more or less of the past execution, and then we now add a new transaction. Yeah. And we explain it all in a very centralized way, as if there would be one computer this, who does this more or less, and no concurrency and no distributed system. So therefore, nowadays, once we understood what the idea is, what the, if we have this one single truth in the blockchain, now we want to talk about how do we reach this consensus in this distributed network. So that's an orthogonal question, which is very important, yeah, because that's the distinguishing property, because we don't do this only in an access spreadsheet or in a database. Uh, but we do this uh, in a distributed system. By the way, I found it interesting uh, that there seems to be an ongoing discussion uh, that um, the author of the Harry Potter books asks people to explain to her the Bitcoin uh, system. And uh, uh, Vitalik Buterin also used this Excel, uh, Excel metaphor. And there was a big shitstorm saying that this would be a very stupid explanation of Bitcoin. Yeah, and uh, to, to be honest, that's true, yeah, because it's a technical definition what Bitcoin is doing for you as computer scientists. But as users, they probably wouldn't be interested in that it, it's technically very similar to an exospecial with macros. Um, so that was a fun fact that happened last week. Um, OK, so now we want to focus on the question, how is this consensus being reached in these um, distributed blockchain systems? Um, so therefore, we first talk about um, uh, what, what would be the so what would be the situation if we do this centrally in a bank? Yeah, uh, and what would what are the limitations of such a central solution? Then we talk about the general. I explain to you the Byzantine general problem, the Byzantine the problem the Byzantine general, um, which was uh, de defined as more or less uh, a canonical problem. Um, by Leslie Lampert in 1982, I think. Uh, so when I was not, was less studying computer science, uh, because it has the nice property that one could mathematically prove uh, that there are certain limits to the decidability of this problem and that you have to do certain assumptions to solve it. And then the interesting question is, how does uh, the blockchain-based system solve this problem? Uh, then we look at block propagation. And then we do a little bit of, uh, yeah, uh, how we say, a tech analysis. How could double spending happen, and how this is, is this avoided in blockchain-based systems? Uh, under which assumptions? Yeah, I think that's the core part of um, these, um, uh, this uh, chapter. And the then, for, and the second part of the lecture, we look at one particular implementation of it, uh, which is based on the proof-of-work algorithm. Uh, and once you understood this general problem, you then know why this is a smart solution and why it, it also may be only in not the perfect solution and why, based on this mining, we want to then extend the consensus mechanism to other uh, consensus uh, algorithms. Okay, um, so therefore we now talked in the last two lectures about the data contained in it, about how transactions work, uh, what account by ledgers are, and um, how the expresses power of Bitcoin script. Yeah? So now we could now design a digital currency with a central authority. Let's say there would be the German bank um, or, the, or the, the Deutsche, the German federal bank, which would run these algorithms. Uh, so what would they do? Uh, so the central authority signs every new block, publishes it to the network, and other nodes validate the content and appends a new block to their own chain. Yeah? So there would be some master uh, server, yeah? like typically uh, some master server at Google, more or less, which contains the truth. And then there would be hundreds or thousands of uh, slave servers, which additionally would validate what this master server says. And once the, what the master says is correct, yeah, no mo new money is created or m money is uh, hidden, um, and all the scripts are correctly executed, uh, then they would spread this news to their own countries or locations, whatever. Yeah? So that would also create a, a consensus, but the difference would be that you have a central authority which does it. And I think now it would be very helpful to, to stop for a minute that you think about what could happen with this master slave approach where the slaves validate what's going on. Yeah? So the bank could not cheat yeah? because all the scripts are executed correctly. The intentions of the users are being addressed. 
and also the business rules are enforced. Yeah, what, what, what could go wrong? Yeah, what could the central authority do wrong? So why wouldn't you want to have a central authority? So please, um, I wrote a post and tweet back answer below, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And that's a core question. Yeah, so uh, sometimes in the audience in, in, in Bitcoin or blockchain lectures ask this question, some of the speakers <laughs> then start uh, to get nervous. So we got some answers. Um, so mm -hmm. the CA could manipulate blocks. The CA is not trustworthy. Um, so maybe you go through each of them. So, so imagine what, what, what kind of, so how could the CA manip manipulate blocks? Um, so the CA could um, include transactions or remove transactions uh, from the block. It could uh, first publish blocks and then maybe later on um, publish new ones with the same height, for example. Um, it could ignore transactions. Um... Okay, let's go. I think the old, so I think it could not manipulate uh, existing uh, transactions. Yeah, so exactly. that uh, so so that's the important point. I think what what. So once once the central authority does anything, it's becoming public and it can be verified. Yeah. So therefore, uh, it cannot let's say wrongly execute Bitcoin. Let's say if you have a condition in your transaction, it cannot manipulate the condition because all the others would validate it again and would say no, the condition was not met. Yeah. So it was not signed, or it, the receiver address has been manipulated. Yeah. Because that would be important. Yeah. yeah that you could. Um, but what is possible? And it's a correct observation that you could suppress information. Yeah, simply it gets some, uh, let's say, request to add something. Uh, let's say, imagine you have a central bank uh, of Germany, and then there would be requests of, I dare say, Chinese uh, companies to add something. And the German bank could simply say, we ignore this. Uh, so that's, I think, one important attack vector. A central authority has always, uh, they could either say, yeah, we never received it. Um, uh, but it, it cannot be validated by the other uh, uh, um, slave systems, whether they what they received or what they didn't receive. What else? So I think that suppression, I think, is the highest risk. Uh, what's the second highest risk? Um, imagine you have a, a, a bid, you have an auction running, and you want to do put your bids into this auction. What would be as difficult or as critical as the suppression of information, of transactions. So that's the delay of transaction. Yeah? You want to pay something, yeah? you, you want to register for an exam, uh, and then the registration never arrives, yeah? or arrives too late. Yeah? Or you want to do a bid in an auction, and the bid arrives after all other bids. Yeah, so therefore, the order of actions is also important in transaction-based systems. So therefore, many of the uh, 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 control of the German stock exchange is done for the fair execution of bids. Yeah? Because the, the Deutsche Börse uh, could do a lot of cheating if they have access and delay and add uh, or give priority to certain actors which pay uh, money for that. Yeah, so that's also the second point. Yeah, that uh, you. You could ignore transactions, or you could more or less delay uh, transactions. So that's the second point. Um, so this, the third point is that if the central authority is not available yeah, due to technical reason, um, so that would be the typical problem if you have only single server, single master, and multiple slave systems. Mm -hmm. If one of the, if the single master fails, it's not available. Nobody could do any transactions. Yeah. So if there would be uh, a, a breakdown of the server. Uh, uh, the network would be uh, not functional. Yeah? So there would be a single point of failure. That's the third point. And then obviously there's a political issue. Yeah, so who decides who is the central authority? Yeah? Uh, and obviously this is also some critical thing and there's an obvious solution for this. Um, if you have a team, let's say, of 10 European states, 
they switch off the Rats forces. Yeah? So therefore, there's a rotation principle that uh, everybody becomes a central authority after a certain time if you have a limited circle of parties. Yeah? With 10, 20 parties, it's easy for you to do a round robin uh, mechanism for um, defining who is the central authority. OK? I thought, but it really helps to think about it, yeah? so that this, uh, the, the security integrity of the transactions is um, uh, validated already in a central system. So therefore, a lot of the benefits can be achieved with the central bookkeeping and signing things and using cryptography. But uh, now the, uh, these uh, problems here uh, are still um, um, yeah, unsolved. So therefore, I think we now want to define now what the idea is. Um, so therefore, the idea is we have now um, multiple parties, let's say multiple European member states or the worldwide uh, collection of all uh, governments of the world, which want to make decisions about the health system. And therefore, they have to find a consensus. Yeah? They have to agree uh, on certain facts, yeah? uh, on the existence and evolution of certain facts. And obviously, they don't want to have one uh, member state, uh, which is the ruler, yeah, Germany, <laughs> making all the decisions, uh, as we can see now. Uh, so therefore, the goal is we want to have a distributed consensus. Yeah? So we have a network of a large number of nodes, N, capital N, and all of these nodes have an input value and propose it to all other nodes. Yeah? Uh, and now, uh, the idea is we might have some, uh, uh, um, so we have certain things that could go wrong. Some of the nodes are faulty in the sense, let's say, uh, the minister of, uh, yeah, so there's a decision to be made uh, with a full consensus. And then simply the minister doesn't show up in the meeting. Yeah, that's a very easy thing, uh, or they don't st stop talking. Uh, so therefore, they are simply not responding to the request to vote. Yeah, uh, the second thing is they are malicious. So therefore, they more or less try to propose the wrong input. Now, so therefore, they say uh, uh, we now want to manipulate uh, uh, the things we got. Yeah? So we don't validate the transactions, but we um, instead of validating the transactions, we cheat, try to cheat. And that then there are maybe uh, 20 member states which try to cheat in the same way. Yeah? So that they say, uh, we don't believe the facts of the virologists. We have uh, alternative facts, and based on the alternative facts, uh, we will uh, work. Um, so therefore, the idea is um, that we want to achieve a consensus that the process has to terminate with all honest nodes in agreement and one input value. Yeah? So if, if all people which don't cheat, um, um, uh, then they produce one input value. Yeah? That they say, now, this is the truth. Uh, and the value that has been generated has to come from an honest node. Yeah? So this is more or less the definition of a distributed consensus algorithm in a blockchain-based system. And I use the alternative, the, the, the example of member states, yeah, just to make it more clear uh, that we have this, why should you have interest in these different, uh, or why do you have cheating people in this network? Uh, more concretely, we want to have the network to agree on the following input in the blockchain-based systems. Yeah, which of the proposed transactions are valid? Yeah, do the business rules uh, apply to all of the transactions? And also, as I mentioned before, it's very important to have the correct order. Yeah, first, uh, this was the first person which did the bid, uh, and then the other person did the bid. Or, bid. or this was first the money was transferred from Peter to Bob, and then from Bob to Bob, Bob to Charlie. Yeah. And that's more or less the important point that we now have to create a consensus on the content of the transactions and the order of the transactions. Uh, OK. And similar things happen. And if you have visited my lecture on uh, Ziba Bachelor uh, on software engineering for business applications, I talk about these problems. If you send messages around in a network, um, uh, you always have the difficulty uh, that messages can get lost. Or there can be uh, people in the network which cheat and which uh, corrupt the messages. And that has been now coined as a general, as a Byzantine generals problem. And um, uh, it des des describes uh, the problem uh, in a mathematical sense. Yeah? Um, so let's talk, look through the history. Uh, the idea is you have now an army 
uh, which uh, which is the Byzantine army, which wants to en invade the enemy city. Yeah, so they are around the city uh, and it's distributed. Yeah, so therefore it's not one place and one ruler who says now attack, but it's distributed and there are um, uh, messengers which move between the different areas where the different uh, generals exist. Yeah, so it's multiple generals. Yeah, so here's a general, here's a general, here's a general. In the middle is the the city that should be attacked. And then that we have a message channel, a messenger, which more or less sends messages around. <laughs> and here the idea is the messengers don't cheat, but the generals uh, send the wrong mails. Yeah? So therefore, for example, here the general A says we should attack to C and B. And the general B says, uh, no, the general A said uh, retrench. Uh, yeah? So therefore you would get now no consensus of these three parties yeah? because it's not clear who was lying here. Yeah? Uh, is B, General B lying? Is this A lying? Uh, so that's the problem here. Um, so therefore the goal is to have a consensus between the divisions, yeah, here in this case three divisions, uh, when, if to attack or not to attack. Um, okay, so therefore their goal is obviously to have the same plan uh, and also make sure even if there are uh, some generals which lie uh, that um, uh, the consensus can be reached. Uh, and the general uh, result, more or less, uh, described in this paper is that uh, if more or equal to one third of the generals are malicious, yeah, so one third of the people are lying, it's impossible for the two third honest generals to derive a common plan. Yeah? So therefore, this is a very uh, difficult problem. Yeah? So cheating can be successful if enough people cheat. Okay. And then the interesting question is, how does now a Bitcoin system achieve this, a consensus about the truth of a, uh, of a blockchain? And I think there was a very nice idea, uh, and this nice idea is not that obvious. And the nice idea is that uh, we don't have to reach a consensus at a certain point in time, but we have an ongoing consensus, and we also uh, allow it to change the history. Yeah? So here with attacking, it's bad yeah, because once you attack, you have to attack at a certain point in time. So you're limited to a certain point in time. This is an implicit assumption here that we have to reach a consensus at a certain point in time. Uh, and also you cannot, once you started to attack, you cannot retreat. Uh, and the idea of Bitcoins is to say, uh, or blockchains is, maybe we can have a different approach of achieving the consensus. Um, um, so therefore, uh, before I come to the solution, uh, uh, we, we also have two, two more problems in Bitcoin, uh, which is known as the number of nodes. Yeah? So the generals, they know how many generals exist, so therefore they could also count, let's say, how, how many messages they get. Yeah? Let's say if they get five messages uh, saying attack and two messages of not attack, um, that more or less gives an indication because you know the overall number of generals. In the Bitcoin network where you allow everybody to join, it's not clear at a given point in time how many people are playing the Bitcoin game. Yeah, so therefore, if you have now a very large network where people can arbitrarily join and leave, and it's not like generals which are nominated and you know them, it's even more difficult to know when are 50% or 30% of the people lying or not. Yeah, that makes it even more difficult. Yeah, so that you say, how could possibly this problem be not solved? Uh, then we also have this problem with time. Uh, I think you also might know this from your uh, lectures in, on operating system, that it's very hard to create a notion of time um, in a, um, without a central uh, node in the network or having something like an atomic clock, which are synchronized by means of uh, physical mechanisms. Yeah, so therefore, if you, <coughs> if you don't want to rely on uh, time servers, which may be, again, uh, corrupted uh, in times of war, uh, then the other question is, how do you establish the notion of time in such a distributed network where people can come and leave? Yeah, uh, so to summarize, uh, at first it sounds to be very, very difficult to achieve this. And therefore now Bitcoin, um, Satoshi Nakamoto did really some very nice job uh, to, to, uh, to have a new approach. And the idea is essentially that he used uh, the idea uh, which is also very popular now in, in algorithm theory, that you move away from deterministic algorithms, that you look much more on a probabilistic consensus. Yeah? So that you say, okay, uh, maybe something goes wrong, 
But if I do it uh, two times, uh, the probability that it goes two times wrong goes down uh, with the multiplication factor. Uh, so therefore, you multiply probabilities, and therefore, after a limited number of steps, if you, even if you have a random uh, a probabilistic result, uh, your assurance in getting the same result multiple times uh, um, exponentially increases. Yeah, so that's one idea that you use a probabilistic consensus that you say, okay, we don't look at one point in time at the result, but we look at it at one point in time, and then we do it again, the game, and then we do it again, and, uh, and then if we have consistent results, we get more and more confidence, or exponentially more confidence in the result if we do the game multiple times. Uh, the second point is, um, if you have now a, a, a group of people, you would assume that some of these people always cheat, and other people are always con uh, 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 honest. Why is this the case? Yeah, once you are investing in a system, and that's what's the reason why uh, social um, humans are social animals, that we more or less judge other humans in our surrounding by their past behavior. Yeah, so if you buy five times at Amazon and it was five times correct, the assumption is the sixth time you buy something at Amazon, Amazon won't cheat. And that's a benefit for Amazon yeah, as a game theory. Yeah, if you play a game multiple times, uh, you create shared trust between the parties yeah, because they reveal something about their strategy. And there are obvious people which try to optimize the system by cheating, uh, which is a minority in most societies uh, because otherwise they will collapse. And the majority of people has learned that if they don't cheat, others don't cheat. And therefore, uh, there's a notion that if some miners are uh, honest, uh, they stay honest. Yeah? So therefore, the best way of achieving more or less uh, the leadership selection is to have randomness, uh, that more or less you select a random node to propose a new block. Uh, so that not, uh, therefore, sometimes the cheaters will be selected uh, and they propose the wrong block. Uh, but uh, then uh, in the majority of cases, if you have a majority of non-cheaters, the non-cheaters will be selected. Yeah? So therefore you don't, let's say, uh, try to elect uh, or elect or create the one uh, true master, but the master changes all the time, yeah? which is also a democratic process, which is also a good idea. Uh, that uh, maybe if you stick always with the same king, it's a bad idea, but if you give the chance to elect a new uh, leader, uh, the chances are lower that the malicious king kills the country. And the third point is, in order to have these long ongoing games, uh, you want to transfer money from the previous rounds of the game to the later rounds of the game, so therefore you have incentives. Uh, that's the idea. If you play a game often enough, yeah, if you are playing the game with Amazon, there's a benefit of uh, Amazon more or less to accumulate trust. Yeah? So therefore, there are incentives because people are willing to pay more for Amazon because they are trusted in. So therefore, the idea of Bitcoin is not only to do a probabilistic consensus and also the random selection of the master, uh, but also to incentivize node uh, to keep playing the game yeah? so that you don't play it for one round, yeah? which is typically... You imagine if you go to a city as a tourist, uh, there's a certain incentive for tourist traps to pay enormous amounts of money if you're sitting on a nice plaza in Italy and to have a rip-off yeah, because you're only coming once. And so therefore you as a tourist are a prey for playing this game once. But whereas the locals, would, uh, once they would learn that they have to pay these high prices, they would never come back. Yeah, so therefore it's very important also to have an incentive to play the time, the, to have something like money, to play the money, uh, the game over and over again. So therefore the idea is the network incentivizes nodes to participate in the consensus algorithm and they receive money, bitcoins for creating the blocks. The bitcoins themselves only have value if you continue to play the game because without the bitcoin blockchain, yeah, if, you, if you kill the bitcoin blockchain, your bitcoins are not worth anything. And so social uh, incentive to build a shared uh, common good, namely the blockchain, and keep the, keep the common good uh, running, which is, I think, a very smart move because it's, not, it's about um, system theoretic thinking and not about uh, very simple algorithms. Okay? Is that clear, the idea, that this is a smart idea? Are there any questions? Okay, then we can continue how this is done technically. And again, we talk about a simplified version about it, and then go one level down how it's exactly be done. 
<clears throat> so okay, we uh, when you talked about this in the gossip network that we have a transaction broadcast. Yeah, so we know we remember this network of peer-to-peer um, uh, uh, -peer communication. Every node who receives a transaction uh, or creates them broadcasts them to the network, making everyone aware of the new transaction. Yeah, so the gossip protocol makes uh, tr distributes the transactions. Then we have the block building uh, phase where every node collects valid transactions, orders them and creates a new block containing the transactions. Yeah, that's what the miners are doing, um, that they um, uh, create valid transactions and then uh, build new um, transactions. So therefore, you might have many people which now have good ideas how to uh, develop, uh, further develop the blockchain uh, because they're doing it all in parallel. And now we do one step which is called random node selection, that a node is randomly chosen out of the network. Uh, and it's able to propose its block to the network, yeah? Because we might have 50 people saying, ah, we have new blocks, uh, and now you have to say what, what of these people, 50 people should you choose? And the idea is to do it randomly in a fair random selection. Uh, and how this is done, we talk about later. So once this one node has been selected, the other don't have a chance to uh, bring in their order of transactions, only that is the becoming the truth. The other nodes now receive, receive the block from the randomly chosen node and validate whether it's correct. Yeah, so therefore, this is now the master and the others are slaves and they can now make sure that uh, the, the block is correct. Uh, and once they did this, uh, they accept the block uh, and once they validated it, they show the exceptions for the block uh, to build. Uh, and they do the showing the exceptions in the, uh, because they now build their new blocks on top of the recently proposed block. Yeah? And so now, obviously, there might be cheaters now uh, which don't, which try to build another blocks. Um, but in the end, now you get a lot of chains. Uh, and since the chains are created by all of the, uh, the parties in the network, um, you can then compare can compare the length of the chains yeah, because the length of a chain indicates how many other people build on top of the other results. Yeah? So therefore, for example, if a chain is six, six steps longer uh, than another chain, you, you know there are six parties which validated it and which paid a lot of uh, energy to build on that chain. And that again uh, shows that uh, there's uh, more consensus on the longer chain. Yeah? So therefore, the general idea is if you have a valid chain which is longer, uh, build on this chain yeah, because uh, the likelihood that it is the correct chain is high. Okay, so that's the idea. Let's look at this example because um, this sounds easy, uh, but there are things that could happen in a distributed system because there's uh, no global, uh, you don't have a global picture of the network. Yeah. So therefore, now on slide number nine, I want to show you we have a very small network and we are a little bit God. Yeah? So we see what these nodes are doing. But you have to remember, since these nodes are, uh, yeah, don't, these are machines and they only talk to, let's say, two or three neighboring machines, and we have now uh, thousands of nodes, they don't know what's going on in the rest of the network. Yeah? So therefore, we as God can now see that the network is, at its whole looks as follows. Uh, but in reality, nobody knows how the whole network looks like. Yeah? So therefore, people, is, people are limited to the data they receive from the other nodes. And since the data they receive from the other nodes are blockchains, this gives us a trick more or less to uh, be more, more effective uh, for, uh, in blockchain-based systems than the Byzantine protocol. Okay, so now we have very simple rules. We only accept valid blocks in the blockchain. Yeah? That's, if I get blocks from the neighbors, I only take valid blocks. And if I get several copies uh, and one longer chain and one shorter chain, uh, I don't look at the content of the chain, but I simply take the longest chain uh, with the highest block, uh, which I take as the one to start with. Um, and in this case, where there's also a slight variation, the longest chain is the one with the highest block number. Uh, but again, uh, there might is a weight also in the blocks, and weights are a way uh, to, sh to more or less uh, also, sh yeah, uh, so look, uh, what's in this block? Yeah, how many transactions are in this block, and how uh, validated it has been? But we explain this later. For now, we look only at the longest chains. Uh, um, and again, if there are multiple blocks arriving, so if there are multiple chains, we don't wait for the next chain to come. But once we get uh, a new block uh, which is longer than another uh, chain. We immediately uh, build on that node. Yeah? So that's the very simple algorithm what we're doing. 
So we now assume now, so these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven nodes, uh, that all of these seven nodes have the same blockchain. Yeah? It's more as an initial state. For example, the initial state is now they all have block, a blockchain which contains of block zero, the genesis block, and an existing block one. And there has been a consensus on the network because they already uh, have a consistent state. Yeah? So that's more as the induction proof starts now with a consistent network. And now we want to see how does the network, starting from a consistent state, reach a new consistent state. Okay, now assume uh, we now get a new block. Yeah? For example, this miner or this node, maybe we say this is Hamburg uh, because it's in the north part, uh, creates a new block with valid transactions which fits to the existing block uh, one or blockchain, which ends with block one. Uh, so this would be validated, uh, this would be created as a valid block, and then this node would propagate it to its immediate neighbors uh, in all directions. Uh, so therefore they would get the new block, they have the hash value of the previous block, they do the computation, they find out it's valid, and therefore they would say, now this is my new valid block, because it was it's, it's longer than the block they have, so therefore they, with rule three, they build on the first block it he, they hear from. Okay, so this was step one, and then in the next step, it has no synchronous, yeah, it could be asynchronous. Uh, now the next neighbors also get this node two, they also verify it with their block one, and they say it's correct and propagated, and for example, this one would propagate it, but you already received it from here, so therefore this node would take the first they get, yeah, and then uh, find out that one of these two would be propagated, and after a third step, uh, the whole network reaches consensus, yeah, because now all nodes after a certain time, let's say six steps or something um, in such a network, uh, every node has validated it, okay? So therefore we reach then consensus in the whole network about uh, the order of transactions, because all these transactions happen, then all these transactions happen in this order, and then these transactions happen in that order, yeah? Okay. Um, so now we create a concurrency control problem a little bit because we now start uh, again in Hamburg, now in this row to the upper left, uh, to create a new block, three, um, which is distributed to its neighbors. It starts its journey through the network. But unfortunately, while this is happening, uh, uh, yeah, because somebody in Adelaide or in Sydney also created blocks number three, and this block is totally in in, uh, non-connected with these nodes. So therefore, while this node is spreading the blue one, the pink nodes are spreading because they are also consistent. Yeah, based on block two, both block three in pink and block three in, uh, in blue can be created. Yeah, so therefore, they now both spread. Yeah, uh, so these nodes become pink and these become blue. Uh, unfortunately, nobody knows, let's say, how many nodes are blue and how many uh, nodes are uh, pink. Uh, because uh, there's nobody, this node doesn't see the state of the network. There could be millions of nodes here, or it could be only these four, or this node cannot see these nodes, uh, it cannot know whether there are millions of other nodes here. Yeah? So therefore, at this stage, we now have two alternative truths. Yeah? So this, there's one truth where block three happened, that's so one potential forking universe where block three is true, and another forking universe where block three in pink is true. Uh, and they're incompatible, yeah, because in this universe, uh, Professor Mattis could have uh, picked up the phone now, and the other universe, Professor Mattis doesn't pick up the phone. Yeah? So these are now two alternative realities which exist, coexist. So therefore, there, there's no consensus currently in the network. Uh, okay, so you would say, okay, totally broken algorithm, unusable, but then this is now the idea, if you think probabilistically, you would say, okay, but there will be other transactions now. And now the other transactions, yeah, so now again, uh, some other node wins the mining puzzle or has the right to become the master and propose a block. So therefore block four is proposed here by accident, it could also be proposed here. And this new block four now uh, gets validated. Yeah, so therefore block four now builds on block three, the uh, blue one. Uh, and now therefore the block now is distributed through the network. Yeah? So therefore now this, this new block resolve uh, leads to a longer chain. Yeah? So the chain with block four is longer than the chain with block three. And the second rule, the longest chain wins, uh, now that breaks the conflict yeah? because now everybody uses block four because block four is valid and is longer than this history. Yeah, so therefore the universe, the parallel universe with the most transactions uh, wins in this situation. So therefore after the next click, now we again have a consensus in the system. 
And now you can do this game over and over again, and then you will find out that this uh, uh, tolerating for limited time an inconsistent state um, uh, makes the system much more um, uh, stable uh, because now these new blocks uh, so resolve um, the, uh, now lead to new masters. And therefore, uh, you now can more or less uh, propagate uh, the truth in the network. Okay, I think that should be clear. Are there questions so far regarding this picture? Have there been more explanations? More explanations? Um, so there is one question. Maybe we can take a look at that one. Um, since a block is chosen at random from a set of nodes proposing new blocks, when the particular block is verified, do the other nodes compute the nonce again since the blocks are appended to a new chain, including this block? So I think the question is, um, how often is this proof of work algorithm applied or do they have to reapply it when a new block arrives? So, so the question is, sorry. I didn't get the question. The, the nonce? Where, 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 sorry, I'm sure we didn't talk about the nonce here. What, what's the question? Uh, what could happen? Um, let me rephrase it. Let me try to rephrase it. Um, so we, we, have a, we have a network and out of these networks, uh, this is an honor, a set of uh, nodes in this network and we chose to mm -hmm. select one node randomly out of this. Um, yeah. And when this, um, this node, which was selected, proposes a new block, then um, do the yeah. other nodes compute the nonce again, so the, the, the proof of work nonce, or do they need to take a new one, or what do they do with their previous computation results? Yeah, up to now we didn't talk about nonce at all. Yeah, so I think the idea would be so f block four has to propose something. Yeah, block four. So the situation you are talking about is there's a new block four, and this this block proposes a truth. Which says, okay, uh, I take, I build on this chain. This is my chain. This is my hash pointer. Uh, this is my transactions. And uh, and now, uh, look, whoever gets now this message now, in the, if I click now again, these two neighbors of this block, the, your question is, what do they do? Yeah, do they? And they would essentially just validate what's written in block four. And block four, as we will later on see, contain contains a nonce and some hash value and some transactions. So that, that, that are the rules of the game. In the, if we have proof of work, uh, it has this nonce uh, value. Uh, if we had another uh, consensus algorithm, there would be some things, and they would simply look at the business rules. And the business rules are for all parties the same. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, and if we, may, we now would have a nonce and uh, a mining puzzle, they would validate that this person validate, uh, uh, solved the mining puzzle, which is easy. They don't have to redo the mining puzzle. They simply have to look whether it's a valid block. Yeah, so therefore, the validity checking of the block is easy, very computationally inexpensive. And now compare it, and you don't have to look at this uh, past ch chain at all because this person built on the same, your same chain. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, you only go back to where you have the fair truth, and therefore you only have to validate these blocks. And so therefore, it's very easy now for the whole network to validate now the truth of block four. By the blue nodes have to now validate this story, and uh, the other ones discard this block and adopt this uh, chain. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so if if uh, we misunderstood your answer, please just create a new one on top of it, and I'll try to um, answer that one. Yeah. Um, and then okay. we have. Um, oh, I can yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I will so, give it to you, yeah, and you yeah, can answer, yeah. Florian. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and okay. we got several questions in terms of what happens to the transactions in block three, but I think that's the next slide. Um, that we're going to talk uh, so, about. Unfortunately, they are both, they are all called three. So this is block three, but you are mostly, uh, now the typical question is, so we have a purple block three, and maybe we should later on rename it three A and three B, that people can refer to it. Um, so the purple one is in the alternative unit terms, which will collapse more or less. So therefore the idea is, um, these transactions um, will be uh, not discarded, and uh, so they will not be included into this uh, chain in the immediate step, but they go to the pool of uh, uh, non-inter, so of offending transactions, the mempool. Yeah? So therefore, these transactions are not killed and aborted, 
but they, they are now added again to the pool of non-confirmed transactions and later other miner will try to add these transactions from this block uh, as transactions to the block five, which comes here. Yeah? So therefore, uh, what happens now is that at a certain time, it looks very promising for the transactions that they are now on block three or the purple block three, but then they will get the bad news as consumers of the network. Sorry, block three was now orphaned. Uh, we are still trying to add your transaction to the network. Yeah. But that's exactly so. Um, the next slides, I think, cover this topic again. Um, but apart yeah. from that, we have no yes. further questions here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so therefore, I think you have now these three states of transactions. Yeah, you have proposed transactions, which are unf unconfirmed transactions. You have uh, transactions which are in a chain. Uh, uh, and then, obviously, it becomes now interesting for you as uh, to see, uh, because it's a probabilistic process. Yeah? It should could happen that now block four, um, um, it looks now very promising that block four is now the truth, or block, uh, the blue uh, uh, block is the truth. But then there might be even larger chain that somebody created a chain which started here and which is now five steps long, yeah? because it's a probabilistic process, so that more or less after a certain time, uh, and uh, the typical rule of thumb in the Bitcoin network is that after six steps, the probability is zero that uh, your block, if it's part of this chain, uh, will be uh, orphaned. Yeah? So therefore, with each block which is built on top of your block, your probability that it will be kicked out at a later stage goes uh, down uh, um, exponentially. So therefore, that's the idea that after six steps, uh, if, if you are six blocks on top of you, or you are the six block steps, uh, you can be safe that this not, will not be rolled back. Okay? And that is what, what this probabilistic thinking means. Huh? Uh, unfortunately, uh, this means now uh, that if this takes very long that these blocks come, uh, you have to wait a long time. Uh, it's not that you immediately pay at the bank uh, or, and you leave uh, because uh, now the cashier at the other side will say, okay, wait a minute, I have to wait until more blocks arrive and then I only trust you that I really have the money because otherwise maybe uh, the money goes away. Huh? Um, yeah, I think this is again, yeah, I think it was exactly the same thing we already now said verbally, yeah, so that now these uh, transactions um, here, the transaction number four, can be added later on to uh, to uh, a later block, block five, four or block five in the future. Yeah. So maybe do this slowly. Yeah. So we have the current block, um, then we um, uh, have in the mempool these four transactions, transaction number four and transaction number five. Um, and uh, they are now included, transaction number, oops, transaction number four, is added to this block, transaction five is added to that block. Uh, so that we now have this situation uh, on, on node A and this situation on node B on the mempool. Uh, and then we have a last uh, block, uh, which is now added onto this, so that now the mempool is cleared uh, in both nodes, uh, this node and this node, um, and uh, the unconfirmed uh, transactions now are all resolved. Yeah, so all, all transactions are included in both blocks. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so um, two questions, I think, um, interesting ones. Um, so what influences the spreading of a block? Why are some blocks chosen to build on and others are not? So can you explain why um, block four um, actually built on the block three blue and not on the purple block three? Um, okay, that two did not. Um, so, yeah, so typically, so, so I as a node always have one, my blockchain. Yeah? I don't keep multiple blockchains as one block, uh, as one node. Yeah? So, therefore, I always, so block, the blue node can only build on the blue uh, blockchain. Yeah? So, everything, uh, so that's the idea. So, that you now um, get some truth and then you, only, so you don't invent new blockchains but you have to propagate things from others, yeah? Uh, 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 so therefore, uh, the, um, the choice is, um, so you're limited to this longest chain uh, rule, yeah? So you have to play this game 
Uh, there's another game. Uh, if you now look at the minor of the uh, the block the, the block block, so I think you have a choice more or less. Uh, you have a mempool with there are 500 transactions in it, uh, which are uh, uh, not confirmed. And now what do you what you do? Um, and that's what Bitcoin does. You can now attach some um, uh, incentive to uh, the, the, the mining reward. You can give. Uh, a transaction fee to the miner and say, okay, my transaction gives you five cent, or um, the other says, I give you seven cent if you put my transaction into your block. And so, therefore, this is now a game uh, that is being played uh, if block four chooses what transactions to include in the new block. Yeah. But this game is not played by the other blocks which take existing blocks. Uh, they have to take them, they cannot unbundle these transactions again and rearrange them. Uh, so they, they have to take more or less the truth from block four. Yeah? But block, the person that creates block four has the freedom to choose which transaction to include, in, to include into block four and therefore would take them typically, uh, because he's selfish, choose the most, uh, um, the highest, highest value transactions. Yeah, or if it's a cheating node, it would try to include as much as possible cheating information that uh, is valid for block four. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, one last question for this uh, slide. Um, will the miner who mined the purple block three still receive his award, his mining reward, although it is not added to the chain? Um... No, uh, no. Uh, so I think the, the so you remember these transactions of block three include all the usual transactions. Uh, so as transaction one, two, three, four, five, seven, and there is the transaction T zero in block three, which is the miner's reward. Yeah, and the miner's reward, if this becomes orphaned, the miner's reward is also re, uh, um, retracted. Yeah. So therefore, once this block becomes orphaned, also the transaction transferred. Uh, transaction becomes orphaned, uh, so he could try later on to, to use it, but since it's coupled to the, the nuns value here, it would be uh, lost more or less. Yeah. yeah, so there is one one interesting exception to that, not in Bitcoin, but in Ethereum. And in Ethereum, actually, due to the block time not being 10 minutes, but 15 seconds, there is something called an uncle uh, reward in terms of where um, blocks which are orphanated actually do get a certain percentage of their reward. So that's a little side note fun fact. But we talked about this in the Ethereum uh, lecture slides. But again, I think what, what you now learn is that this is now, you know, typically in computer science, you have two different branches. So one is more or less discrete mathematics, where it's all about true and false, and yes or no, or there exists a line or no line. Uh, and then there's a statistic where it's all about probability and risk and amount of money and uh, uh, gains, yeah, where it's more or less, um, where it's more or less analysis yeah, on statistics. Yeah. And the interesting thing is now uh, what we now see in with deep learning and with uh, probabilistic algorithms is that the mixture of both is even more powerful than each of them alone. Yeah, so because in some things you make uh, deterministic decisions, A appeared before or after, that's a binary choice, yeah, and there's a sequence which makes binary choices, but the process of making decisions and, and of, of, uh, is uh, probabilistic. Yeah? And that I find very interesting in computer science, uh, since the time when I studied it, it was very much biased towards discrete mathematics, then there is this shift to uh, probabilistic things, uh, but again, in the end, people have to make uh, yeah, binary choices. Yeah, either this is true or this is true, uh, and so therefore you always then have this step where you uh, go back and uh, based on probabilistic decisions, probabilistic input, you make binary decisions. Yeah? And so therefore, this is also some like you do it in machine learning uh, that you more or less. Uh, uh, so therefore, try to be as discrete as possible and deterministic as possible. Uh, but in between, if you then use um, probabilistic mechanisms, uh, it, they more or less sometimes lead uh, yeah, totally new opportunities. Now. So, um, yeah, okay. So now, um, um, yes, what are typically other questions people would ask at this point, yeah? For example, can we steal bitcoins? Yeah. So if I'm an, uh, a not 
And that's the triple idea of bank robberies. Yeah, yes, that maybe yeah, there are some people which now, since they are miners, they steal money. Yeah. Um, so therefore, it's you can get the answer. Obviously, if there's money, always money is. Uh, uh, bound to an unspent transaction output, so the money is not lying around, so somebody cannot simply spend the money for some other purposes. Yeah, because it's, there's already a signal which is below it, it cannot be faked. Yeah. So therefore, stealing bitcoins and redirecting money streams uh, into different directions is impossible here. Yeah. So the only way would be that you create transactions to, uh, which go to your own pocket, um, and um, so that would be, uh, but that's not possible for output from other people. Yeah. So then, uh, is it possible to block a participant wallet owner in the blockchain network? Yeah, so that's the idea that maybe uh, some miners say, uh, let's say we are now a Reichsbürger miner, yeah? <laughs> so, uh, and we want to what is, uh, exclude certain people in Germany to uh, do transactions on the network. Yeah? So therefore, the idea would be now we have a malicious node that wants to block all transactions by Bob. Yeah? As I'm dissing a little bit Bob. Uh, this malicious code was selected randomly by the network to propose a new bet, and therefore it uh, revokes to include the transaction from Bob, even though Bob would be willing to pay millions of euro for the transaction to be included. So therefore, once he has been selected as the um, uh, as a miner, uh, he could block it, but later on in the next random round, uh, if it's if it's a random round. Uh, some other person will include Bob's transaction. Yeah? So therefore, this is the idea. Since there's not one master, but the masters uh, which make the decision and add the new block are randomly chosen, um, then uh, uh, it, you cannot be sure uh, as one per person to, um, to, to block other people. Um, this obviously leads to the next question. So then I have a good new idea. So I'm now uh, Bill Gates, and uh, Bill Gates is evil. So therefore, evil, <laughs> evil people and Jewish people always have lots of money. So therefore, they now would create tons of blockchain nodes. Yeah? So therefore, Bill Gates would not only run one node, but he would run hundreds of nodes. Yeah? Uh, and that's called the civil attack. A civil attack more or less creates voters, and all these voters are the same person. Yeah, uh, and if obviously, if you believe in the evilness of uh, Bill Gates, you would assume that this is the attack Gates will choose. Yeah, um, and yeah, and that's what is this idea of uh, a simple attack? Yeah? And we will come to it later why we avoid it. Um, okay, so therefore, another question is now. Um, so uh, yeah, so therefore, um, this blocking. Would be possible if I could create arbitrary number of nodes, uh, and then with high probability my nodes would block uh, Bob. Yeah. Uh, another point is double spending. Is it possible to, that I have one coin and I spend it in two directions? Yeah, because that's the obvious idea that you print money uh, as digital copies. Yeah, um, and yeah. Uh, so therefore, the idea is now. Uh, the idea is now that you want to create now uh, two transactions which spend the same transaction output. Yeah? So therefore, you would create a, a two transactions which spend now the money to put it now. Now it's now Alice and Bob. Yeah, Alice wants to buy a music file from Bob. Yeah? So therefore, uh, um, she creates a transaction now which sends the, the bitcoins to Bob. Um, and Honest Note sees Alice's transaction and includes it in his in his in his block. Bob sees the new block and sees the transaction included, he sends the file to Alice in good faith to have his money. Yeah? Um, and now, obviously, there are options for Alice to double spend the money. Yeah? So he sees the block, and as we discussed, there could be now uh, other concurrent blocks created by Alice or other people, which, no, not, not by other people, by Alice, that Alice spends, creates one transaction to buy a music file from, let's say, Bob, and another uh, transaction which spends the same money to buy a music file from another music file from Amazon, and a third transaction uses spending the same money for um, a third party. Yeah, so therefore, Alice could try now to create a lot of transactions which uh, are sent to different nodes, even uh, to create for temporary change, which include the, all of these transactions. But sooner or later, yeah, so therefore, let's go back here. So Alice would create more or less one transaction here in block three, one tra uh, transaction in this block, and even a third transaction in the third block, which now exists now in the network. 
Yeah, so, and this is true. It could happen for a certain point in time that Alice money is in this reality spent here, in this reality spent there, in a third reality spent somewhere else. But, but sooner or later, the, the whole chain has to converge, will to converge again based on this probability selection mechanism. So therefore, after this step, this a trial to spend the money would be invalid. And maybe later on, uh, also the third block, which exists concurrently, would also be dominated by block four or another reality. Yeah? So therefore, this convergence of the cons consensus over time uh, makes sure that even though a certain time it looked as if it was spent twice, and if uh, a party would only look at these blocks, one party would think uh, they already had the money, and the other party thought they had the money. But if they wait long enough, six steps, um, there only one party would see that they really have the money. Yeah, so therefore, this, we have to extend the waiting time to be sure that you, you don't uh, send your goods before the six blocks are put on top of Alice transaction. Okay? I think we did this already. Or oh, is there something I should mention here which is not already explained? Oh, that's okay. Okay. Yeah, so again, I did it all now on paper on the fields where my finger pointing. Yeah, so this is more or less that block four sooner or later determines which reality takes place, and therefore we already had this. Okay. Um, okay, so now, so far, so good. Now we have now the interesting question, how to, who is allowed to select the next block? And most of you already asked the right questions because about the mining puzzle. So the way Bitcoin solves the problem is to have a, a proof of, uh, ha has a proof of work uh, uh, puzzle. So therefore, um, so we have, and the nice part about this mining puzzle, it solves multiple problems at once. Um, so the first one is that you have this unknown user base, yeah, like the Byzantine generals. We don't know how many generals are playing the game. So therefore, uh, it's hard for us more or less. Imagine you would have things done like a round robin mechanism, like in the European Commission. There has to be some somebody to say now, after Germany, the next president is Italy. Yeah? And this party, which assigns the right to vote or to be the master, uh, it would be, again, a central authority. And, and again, instead of having a central authority, we now use the puzzle, uh, this random algorithm that everybody plays, so that by chance, um, we can be sure that uh, uh, with, with the probabilistic, that the chance that always the same person will uh, become the miner uh, that um, gets the next block goes down to zero. Yeah? So therefore, we have a fair selection by a random selection of the nodes. Uh, and also now the question is, how do we avoid that if we do this random uh, selection, yeah, um, uh, that not too many nodes are automatically generated? And therefore the idea is now that if, if a, perp, a person wants to um, be selected, they have to do some work. Yeah? So therefore, if you now want to create 100 nodes, you have to pay 100 times more a scarce resource. Yeah? Uh, and the scarce resource, I think, in computing, you essentially have two, two scarce resources uh, as on a computer. One scarce resource is the compute power. Uh, that you say now uh, you have to spend energy to do the computation. Or another not that scarce resource, because we have very efficient storage structures, is you have space. Uh, that you say in order to, to, to solve a puzzle, you have to have two gigabytes of uh, RAM. Yeah? So therefore, if, uh, if you want to now create lots of nodes, you have to buy a lot of RAM. Um, or the space of, you know, on a cloud of a lot of run space or a lot of CPU of time. Yeah, and that's essentially the idea of the mining puzzle, that the mining puzzle uh, is the scarce resource, because if you want to spin up a lot of mining nodes, you have to spend a lot of energy. Yeah? And that is limiting more or less the, the ability to create simple attacks. Um, Okay, so therefore the scarce resource is computational power. Um, you then use the search puzzle, which we discussed already, uh, which requires a large amount of tries, high investment in costs, high energy costs, uh, and which obviously leads to an arms race, because now if you have computers which are very efficient in solving the puzzle, uh, like special purpose hardware, then they are more um, uh, successful, and now everybody will buy this more successful hardware. It, in the end, leads to high attack costs, uh, and it also allows a fully anonymous mining, because the miners simply have to 
uh, produce a result, but, but they don't have to say who they are uh, and um, uh, which amount of money they could possess, etc. So more or less, it's a rather simple process. So therefore, this proof of work is a very nice mechanism to bootstrap such a Bitcoin a blockchain-based system, because initially a lot of people would do this mining puzzle, yeah, because it's initially cheap to do it, and once they did the mining puzzle, they also want to play to the rules, uh, because they're mining the new coins of a new coin, they created the Ethereum blockchain or the Bitcoin blockchain, should gain value, so therefore they would uh, not uh, play against the rules of the Bitcoin network. Yeah, so therefore it's a good way of bootstrapping a network from zero nodes to let's say thousands of nodes, uh, because they now can separate uh, and do this work. Uh, once you have an established network, there's a new opportunity. We are now have an established currency like Bitcoin, which you can trade, you can have exchanges for it, uh, you can look at the, at the exchange rates, and then people are in, uh, try to use now this coin yeah, for doing trading or for doing speculation. Yeah? So therefore, after the bootstrap phase, uh, where you did proof of work, you could potentially switch to a proof of stake algorithm. What's this proof of stake algorithm? So the idea is as follows, that if you want to propose a new block, uh, yeah, you say, okay, this is my new block. You also at the same time put money uh, on the table. Yeah, you say, let's say here is uh, one block. And if somebody later on can verify that this uh, block was uh, uh, illegal, uh, this other person can take my money, which I put on the table. Now, for example, I put, let's say, 1,000 euro on the table, uh, and I say, so uh, believe me, this is the right block, uh, and if you can prove that it's not the right block, you get my 1,000 euro. Yeah? So that's the idea of proof of stake. Yeah? So that you more or less put now the new currency used as a stake, um, and, um, and then obviously you can... Uh, People have a strong incentive not to lie, yeah, because yeah, why, why should they lie if there's money on the table? Uh, it is simply more or less a losing game. Yeah? So that's therefore spoof of stake is also a very uh, attractive way of doing it. There is some point uh, which uh, yeah, some people, or well, many people think, uh, in particular people which love, love decentralized systems, is that obviously if you have very rich people, it's like in poker, yeah, if you now have very rich people, uh, they get now more right to vote, yeah? because if the stake would be 1 million euro and you don't have 1 million euro, you cannot participate in voting. Yeah? Uh, and that's what is, again, the idea that the rich people can vote if they vote, uh, and they get a mining reward, and then they get richer. Yeah? So which, which is more or less a typical problem in financial systems, that rich people have much more opportunities to do betting, bidding and trading and, and uh, leveraging bias. Uh, so therefore, the financial system often has this unfortunate tendency to make rich people even richer. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so I think this is essentially the, uh, the uh, two options, more or less. And there's, as I said, this option only makes sense if already the currency is established. So therefore, you sometimes switch between proof of work and proof of stake. Okay, so this is the mining puzzle repeated. I think we already talked about this. So, uh, and then I, I think we have an important point. We have now this hash puzzle. Um, and now I think it's very important to understand that not everybody, uh, if you have now miners, that all the miners don't solve the same puzzle. Yeah, so because otherwise, if now all the miners would solve the same puzzle, they could more or less cheat and take the result they found from the other miners and say, this was my result, yeah, I found it out. Uh, so therefore, uh, we have to now remember how the uh, Bitcoin uh, block that is getting mined looks like. And so therefore, the, the, the block looks as follows. It contains the header information. It contains the transactions that uh, are given by the wallet owners, uh, transaction one, two, up to, up to N. Uh, but then there's also an additional transaction which is added by the miner because the miner says now, all the remaining fees of these transactions and the mining reward should go in my pocket. And my pocket is this wallet ID, which is in the transaction number zero. Yeah, so that's more or less the, um, uh, the, I think it's, it's a block reward transaction. Um, this is technically the first uh, the transaction with index zero. Yeah, and since this transaction goes to different wallets, yeah, because miner one wants to get it to miner one's pocket, miner two wants to get it to miner two pocket, uh, the, the hash uh, puzzle is different for each of the miners. Yeah? 
And this means now that it's not easy simply for one miner to copy the results of the alpha miner and then modify this value because this value, if it's modified, uh, doesn't the, the, the puzzle has to be solved again. Okay. No questions? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now um, the interesting point is now, uh, and again, this, this is from the, you know, this idea of resilient systems uh, is that, um, uh, um, how would you say it? Um, so the question is now, how difficult should the mining puzzle be? Yeah. Uh, and that to, to let's say, uh, Tensions. Yeah, one is it should be not too difficult because if the mining puzzle is very difficult, it takes a long time to solve it. Um, and if it takes a long time to solve it, the time between a user submitting a transaction and the transaction being confirmed gets longer and longer. Yeah, so therefore there's one tension to make uh, the uh, puzzle easy so that it can be easily solved uh, and uh, the result is uh, available early. Uh, the second reason it should not be too easy because otherwise the um, um, network could be flooded by too many uh, transactions coming in and you would get too many orphan blocks. Yeah? And so therefore the heuristic value which is to be achieved in Bitcoin network given the uh, distribution time of the network and the compute time is that the network itself uh, is the most stable and the most effective uh, because it doesn't create too many orphan blocks. If the block time is very low, maybe, maybe 10 minutes. Uh, so, um, and now the idea is now that the network um, dynamically computes the difficulty of the puzzle. Yeah? Because if you have now a network with only 100 uh, nodes, these 100 nodes can, uh, yeah, uh, they solve maybe the puzzle in, uh, on average in uh, 10 minutes. But now maybe it becomes very attractive to become a miner. Now uh, hundreds of other nodes, uh, no, thousands of other nodes are uh, created. So therefore these uh, thousands of other nodes would then with high probability uh, quicker uh, solve the puzzle. And again, um, the block time would go down. Uh, so therefore the idea is now that the, um, the network has an built-in algorithm to look how long it, how long it took uh, until the last 2016 blocks have been mined. Yeah? That's the time, more or less, the speed of the network with which it uh, adds new blocks. Yeah? And if it turns out that now the speed, uh, because now, let's say, there's more power for compute hardware or there are more miners doing the work, uh, as soon as the speed uh, goes down, uh, up, and so the speed goes very high, um, then the mining puzzle gets uh, um, uh, duplicated. Yeah? It gets increased. Um, or it typically gets um, decreased if the mining time gets too slow. Yeah? And so therefore every 2016 blocks, uh, a new, uh, let's say, difficulty level is computed by the network. And so therefore you get a dynamic resilient system, uh, which is resilient against, let's say, both scenarios, an explosion of compute power or a loss of total interest of, uh, in mining because it's not profitable that many people leave the network and don't do mining anymore, then the difficulty would get, get uh, simpler and it would be more profitable for the mining miners to, to work. And again, it's a game theoretic approach which leads to an, a dynamic equi equilibrium with market-based approaches. Um, okay, um, then we now have a Bitcoin currency which is then described more or less by the data uh, you describe it, yes, or that's um, some special words. Yeah, so the question is, for example, how, what's the largest amount of money you can represent? Yeah, so therefore, you, so what's the, the upper limit of uh, uh, value that can be created? And in Bitcoin, the decision has been made that it should be 8-bit, 64-bit, bit, uh, uh, which creates, let's say, as you know, an enormous amount of uh, numbers, more or less, output, like the uh, larger than the number of uh, atoms in the universe. Um, the currency is then represented by an unsigned integer. It's not, not something like 10 euro and 20 cent. It's not a, a, a fraction of a value, yeah, but it's all uh, full numbers, yeah, integer numbers. And the smallest number is not one bit, but one Satoshi, yeah, which is the smallest unit. And that's what is a very, very, very tiny amount. 
Yeah, and the base unit is one Bitcoin, which is 100 million Satoshi. Yeah, that's what is the convention that uh, if you talk about Euro, that the Euro is uh, 100 uh, cent. Uh, and here is uh, one Bitcoin is 100 million Satoshi. And obviously the idea is more or less to uh, have very small transactions also and small values which can be tra transferred. Yeah. Um, so that more or less by dividing euros or by dividing bitcoins, you still get integer numbers which can be easily represented yeah, by having this high uh, base unit. Uh, so and the maximum amount of bitcoins is limited, uh, and this is the number here, uh, and it's computed by uh, not by a fixed number that there's an upper limit which, which is encoded, but it's um, uh, derived by uh, the properties of the mining process, which I discuss in a second. Uh, let's see. Um, so uh, I think we. Mm -hmm. I would try it. Yeah, but I, think I want to try to explain this diagram, and then we will be finished. So therefore, it's very important um, to understand now that there are two contributions uh, for the miners to play the game. Yeah. So one contribution is important at the beginning of setting up a new blockchain, which is uh, the mining reward. Yeah? So that people, even if there's not much traffic on the network, if there are a small number of transactions and people don't want to pay a lot of transaction fees, there is an intrinsic mining reward built, given by the system to, new, uh, to, to miners if they create new blocks. Yeah? So therefore, this is something which is more or less, uh, it's like a bank, yeah? so that a bank gets in the reward by the, uh, that it exists. And then the bank has to earn money itself by uh, confirming transactions, which is transaction fee. And that over time of a banking system, uh, this changes. Yeah? So therefore, if you now look at the history uh, of, the future, uh, of the future development um, of the minor rewards, we see this diagram. Um, so therefore, the, the algorithms of Bitcoin say uh, that there are uh, depending on the, the the length of the, the block, uh, the, the Bitcoin, uh, the blockchain. Yeah, so this is the the, the Genesis block. Uh, these are the first um, 210,000 blocks here. Then the next 420,000 blocks. The next 630,000 blocks. So there's a certain uh, uh, events in the future which are defined by the algorithm when the uh, the the amount of mining reward is halved. Yeah, so the mining rewards initially was very high, 20,000 uh, bitcoins for the very first transactions, then 10,000 bitcoins, 5,000, uh, 2,500, etc. So it goes down to zero. So therefore, in the uh, seed phase of this or the creation phase, uh, most money of the miners is won by uh, mining rewards yeah, by simply being there. Uh, and being the first ones, they get a lot of uh, money for being the first ones and sticking to the game. But once they're in the game, uh, the whole system changes that now um, the money is limited. Yeah, so we don't create new money here. So the blue ones create new money. Um, and that's the newly created money. And uh, we are now in April 2019, we're here. And later on, all the mining re uh, rewards uh, later on come from, uh, from the... Uh, Transaction fees. Yeah. So, so this is more the creation phase, more or less, uh, setting up of the, the blockchain uh, Bitcoin, and this is a very stable area. And since now the number of new Bitcoins mined, uh, this approaches a limit. Yeah. And therefore, this is exactly this limit of existing Bitcoins that have been created is this curve. And if you compute it now as the limit, the limits of this halving period, uh, this is this upper uh, amount of 29. Um, what was it? 20,999. 20, so 20 million or whatever bitcoins, yeah. and this is again also important yeah, because it's like uh, with gold. Yeah, there's a limited supply of gold, so therefore the value more or less in the future of bitcoins will go very much up. Yeah, because there's very scarcity of these bitcoins, and so therefore the more people use bitcoin, the more the value of these initial bitcoins is go going up. And there's no dilution of money. I think, uh, so as you see, uh, there's a lot of game theory, probabilistic thinking going on, uh, which almost broadens your scope, how the systems can be built and how social structures like money or uh, trust can be established. And so therefore, I hope you like this uh, episode uh, and uh, you join in and don't press the subscribe button. 
um, uh, when we talk about uh, the uh, next uh, chapters of our lecture. Thank you very much and goodbye. And welcome back to today's lecture on blockchain-based systems engineering. Um, it's again Uli on the microphone, uh, or the hidden microphone, uh, taking your questions and me, Florian. Uh, we are in the last session uh, regarding Bitcoin. Yeah, I think you might be surprised how many details there are behind the simple idea of a bit, uh, blockchain. Uh, but I think it helps to do this uh, with a deep dive on Bitcoin so that we then later on prepared for uh, Ethereum, uh, Corda, and Hyperledger yeah? uh, because they have very similar ideas. And uh, I think what's cool here is that it's really a nice mixture between technical solution and game theory in the sense that people run the system. Yeah? And the, the system itself is written in a way that uh, people which are selfish, uh, run the system in a very organized way. Yeah? So I think that, that's the main innovation we see here, which also then leads to this idea that maybe we now have also a new economy, uh, which is built on this idea of having consortia of people. Uh, each of them is selfish, but they still create a consortium to uh, achieve together more than a single entity, yeah? which I think is also a very interesting idea because often you have this idea uh, that uh, you have this winner-takes-it-all uh, solutions yeah, that uh, if you have a successful uh, online commerce shop, uh, it gets even more successful uh, the larger it becomes. Yeah. And that's also a problem we see now uh, also in the globalization, yeah, that some countries are the winners, and the richer they are, the easier it is for them to get out of our crises. And that's, uh, I think, always very interesting uh, whether we can have a social system uh, or whether we have an egoistic system. Okay, but that's a little bit philosophic, um, and now we look a little bit more at, at these, these game, the rules of the game, yeah, which we see in Bitcoin. And as usual, there are some ideas which look very nice at the beginning, but later on as you run the system, you find out the edge cases where the system also gets into uh, bad situations, and we will talk about this here also. Okay, um, I started now with this slide um, as a, a reminder what we finished off last week. Uh, so we now look at the Bitcoin currency and there are a lot of uh, um, e-commerce uh, or, or digital currencies based on Bitcoin uh, blockchains. Uh, so therefore it has this symbol. Uh, then the question is, let's say, how, how large is more or less the currency, the maximum representable value? Uh, and since the number of Bitcoins is limited, uh, it's easy to fix also an upper limit. Even if you have hyperinflation, uh, that wouldn't happen yeah, because the uh, amount of Bitcoins is limited. So therefore, you now also can uh, compute, let's say, the maximum size here. You represent the values by unsigned integer, not by floating point numbers. Uh, and it's unsigned, it's not a decimal point, uh, because the smallest unit is one Satoshi, and one Satoshi is 100 millionth of uh, a Bitcoin. Yeah? So therefore, this allows to do very tiny amounts and tiny fees on the one hand side, but also to have extreme large uh, values here. Okay, so that's more or less uh, the, the characteristics of these coins. And you could imagine systems where you have different maximum amount, maybe you have a maximum amount which decreases over time uh, to make uh, the resource even scarcer, or that if you hold money too long, uh, it loses its value. Yeah? And these are the games you now can play with digital systems, yeah? that, that you don't have to have the very same idea like if you have uh, fiat money. Uh, if we continue now for Bitcoin, and in Bitcoin, the rules of the game are as follows, that uh, not all coins are created at the beginning of the system, but these coins are initially, uh, you start with a low amount of coins, yeah, and then with the increasing size or height of the blockchain, blockchain, yeah, so this is the blockchain with the Genesis block, and then you have a blockchain with 210,000 blocks, and this is the linear scale, so after a while you have 6,930,000 blocks, uh, and then at that point, all of the Bitcoins um, uh, have been mined in this mining process. So therefore, initially, a lot of, uh, with, um, uh, a lot of coins are created uh, in a short time. And right now we are here, or now we are here, or probably I think here, uh, if we have a linear, uh, so somewhere here. So therefore, the number of available Bitcoins which will still be mined is foreseeable. Uh, and uh, at the same time, while the Bitcoin uh, reward for mining reward for getting new blocks uh, is um, reduced, yeah, the number of new 
um, the block reward is decreasing now, and I think uh, some time ago we halved, uh, did the halving event, so that now uh, the number of um, uh, coins you get for a new block is uh, uh, is um, reduced by a half. Yeah. At the same time, this means now that people that want to get uh, transactions entered into the Bitcoin have to pay higher fees. Yeah. And that's the idea that uh, now initially all uh, the system is uh, run by greedy people, which say now we we bet on the success of the system and we get a lot of coins in this newly created coin. And maybe later on they will be very valuable, yeah. Because now it's at the beginning it's easy to get them, uh, but later on it will be very difficult to get them, and the price will skyrocket here. Uh, as a built-in incentive here. And on the other hand, later on, uh, once the value reward goes down to zero, uh, the, it's moving to a system where a lot of people are invested in the system, and therefore they are also willing to pay fees from their transactions. Yeah, and that changes over time. Yeah, in a dynamic process, yeah. For example, if the system wouldn't grow very rapidly, uh, maybe it takes much longer to do this. But since we run now at full speed, the blockchain, uh, so we can rather nicely predict uh, when this will happen. Okay, so now we can look at the transaction fee, and uh, it's based on uh, supply and demand. Yeah? So it's not the case that the miners say, I want to have so much money from you. So they don't ask for a price like the bank and say, uh, now the price of your Giro Conto goes up, and I want to have it, and I'm the bank, you have to do it. But the, it's in the opposite way. You as a customer say, I'm willing to pay for this transaction so much money. And then there's a pool of miners, which now could say, okay, it's too low, I don't mine it. Or people say, no, there, it's, it's the best price I can get right now, so therefore I will take it. Yeah? And so therefore you can influence also uh, the speed with which your uh, um, transactions are integrated into blocks. Yeah, if you pay a high fee, uh, every selfish miner uh, would say, uh, "Oh, super! I take these transactions with a lot of where I can earn a lot of earn a lot of transaction fee." And so, therefore, if you look over time in times of crisis uh, or uh, market volatility, for example, here this was in December, I think, 2017, the, pri the transaction fees went up. Because all people wanted to buy Bitcoin, yeah, the price was going up. So everybody wants to be the next and early in to, to gain from this uh, uh, increasing price. Uh, yeah. And the same also happens if the price goes down in a time of crisis. Everybody wants to leave, sell their Bitcoins as fast as possible, to, as fast as possible, as quickly as possible for the highest possible price. And therefore, you see now uh, at, at one point in time how many. Um, uh, what, if you look at the transaction at a given point in time, there are some transactions which don't pay uh, many fees. Yeah, uh, if, if everybody pays high prices, this number goes down. But then there are people which are willing to pay more fees uh, because they are relaxed and they say it should happen, but they don't want to waste too much money for it. And then there are people which are very, very, very uh, eager to get their money out because maybe it's a very high transaction volume uh, or the trans amount they want to transfer uh, and they pay very skyrocketing prices here. Um, technically, this uh, transaction fee is um, defined in the Coinbase transaction. Uh, that was the transaction number zero, and the Coinbase uh, transaction is the first transaction in the block, um, and it has no transaction output. Uh, so, therefore, the transaction output can be freely is determined um, is set to the wallet of the miner. Yeah. Um, and so, therefore, the miner can now set this uh, target address. Uh, and uh, put it, the money in his own wallet. Um, yeah, additionally, in the Coinbase transaction, there's some free space, yeah, because you don't write too much things in there. So therefore, it stores uh, uh, also the block height, yeah. So um, which is not in the header, but in the Coinbase transaction, for historic reasons. And also, you have space for 100 arbitrary bytes. And uh, because uh, this would be the script signature uh, field, uh, and uh, you can use it then to, to put arbitrary things into it. And that was the story when some people put in URLs or text fields, etc. Uh, and then there was some discussions whether this could be pointers to child pornography, and whether the whole Bitcoin should, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain should be shut down because it contains uh, pornographic content. Yeah. So also. Some interesting developments. Um, 
Okay, uh, what now happens is that miners um, have to do this mining puzzle. Uh, and uh, obviously, if you invest more in mining hardware, let's say if you, uh, for, like, for example, take a supercomputer uh, of your university or your researcher in a Russian uh, atomic uh, research center, and you then do mining on this machine, uh, you will have um, a good luck that uh, you will solve the puzzle as the first. Yeah, and obviously this leads now to a mining um, arms race that um, the miners uh, want to get the best hardware to win the game, but since everybody's buying um, uh, more expensive or more um, uh, powerful hardware, uh, this is to the situation that the same cake, yeah, namely the, uh, the number of transactions that can be mined, uh, is a split now, you have to pay more money but in the end, uh, uh, you only have so much money which you can uh, earn. Yeah, so therefore there's a limit, more or less, that uh, it becomes not non-profitable to invest too much money uh, if you don't steal more or less the compute resources of your employer. Yeah, so therefore the arms race is more or less driven by uh, the price of the mining hardware. Initially, this was done with CPUs. Uh, like a, a normal laptop computer. Uh, then there was a step in 2010 that you went to GPUs, which have a lot of parallel hardware. And since the mining puzzle can be nicely parallelized, um, uh, the number of cores of these uh, GPUs and the vector size of these GPUs uh, gave uh, miners a, a huge advantage. Uh, then the next step was the development, uh, because so many people wanted to have this, that it was profitable to create chips which are optimized to do nothing else than compute, uh, no, to, to, to use FPGA uh, to program or to use program or gate arrays to, uh, to run the byte, the, the puzzle. And finally, even it was so profitable to build application-specific integrated circuits. Yeah? So you really had a design which could denote nothing else than Bitcoin mining. And then you get these more or less uh, farms of ASIC computers. Yeah, and this it leads to the fastest mining, and um, and also, uh, um, yeah. So now miners have a lot of very expensive hardware. Um, uh, again, uh, okay. So the arms race. There was this idea of Satoshi to say, uh, so we should stop doing this because it's like uh, in the Cold War. Uh, we spend so much uh, of our money to do the mining, but in the end, nobody wins. Yeah, so, uh, you should stop it. But obviously, people across continents are not uh, able to, to, let's say, have some mining uh, disarmament uh, treaty. Uh, so therefore, uh, over time, here this was a step when uh, GPU hardware was introduced, the difficulty went up uh, very rapidly in a short uh, amount of time, uh, so that everybody bought GPU-based mining uh, hardware. Uh, if you look now uh, up to now, to date, uh, it's also the same thing. Uh, it's really exponential growth of hash rate. Um, fortunately, these uh, devices are rather energy efficient. Yeah, so this is not really one-to-one -one correlated with the energy consumption. But you see the terabyte of hash per second uh, in the network. Yeah, so therefore, uh, this goes really rapidly, uh, exponentially up until this peak when it became uh, economically uh, with the current hardware, not economically feasible to do this. Then there was a drop, more or less, in the my, uh, hashing rate, which then went up again. Yeah, so people stopped mining here because it uh, was not profitable. Uh, but then uh, there was enough traffic, and it went up again. Yeah, um, and that's more or less the, the big problem we have now here: that the proof of work uh, is terribly uh, wasting computing resources. Yeah, if you would use this for genome sequencing and COVID. <coughs> uh, uh, COVID virus vaccination uh, uh, molecule simulation, uh, that would be much better uh, use of this. Yeah? And there had been some ideas. Uh, could, would it be better to have some uh, algorithms which do some sensitive stuff as a proof of work? But since it's not clear uh, what is the right result, it's not so easy to check it whether the result is correct, uh, the, the simple mining puzzles are being used. Um, so, also what, hap what happens now here is with this arms race, if you look at these farms, uh, it becomes very expensive. Yeah? In the early days, you could use your, your old computer to do this, but buying a farm is a huge investment. Yeah? So, therefore, if something happens now 
that uh, you become a member of a pool. Yeah, so that you own some of these thingies here, um, and you contribute to a pool. Um, so that you more or less have a business uh, where you can create a pool of miners. Uh, and so, uh, therefore, the pool more or less flattens out this risk that you do mining for a long time and you're never successful, yeah? so that you don't get any revenue. Yeah? Whereas if you're a member of a pool, yeah, it's the same with if you play lottery, uh, it's very unlikely that you win a very large amount of money. But if you're uh, in a pool, uh, so it's very unlikely uh, that you win uh, a lot of money if you're alone. But if you're in a pool, the likelihood that somebody in the pool earns money uh, gets higher, and so therefore the risk um, is limited. Yeah. So therefore, being member of a pool has the benefit that somebody runs the pool for you, uh, and that uh, in the pool uh, you have a more stable income. Uh, um, and that's more or less the main, main reason why we now have a lot of mining pools here. The question is now. Uh, how do you make sure that the pool doesn't do dirty tricks, yeah? so that uh, they more or less cheat? Um, but again, um, so therefore the idea is a mining pool works uh, that uh, the manager proposes for each new block a block prototype to, to his pool. Um, so that says, okay, that the transaction zero uh, sends the money to the pool manager. So everybody would now see later on if the solution has been found and would know that the pool manager got this money. There could be the, the uh, risk that the pool manager keeps this money and doesn't give it to the other members of the network, but obviously that was would be the last time that the pool manager did this because now everyone will say this is a not as a cheating pool manager. So again, since this game is not only played once, uh, it doesn't make sense for a pool manager to cheat, yeah? Because if you have uh, cheating pool managers and the other uh, honest pool managers, everybody would go to the honest pool managers. Yeah, and these are the typical things you always have to think about if you have uh, such uh, blockchain-based systems. Uh, what are the, the long-term benefits of people cheating? Yeah? And people not only want to win once, they want to uh, uh, do this for a longer time. Um, and again, here you see it's a calculation. Um, so that, for example, um, if... Um, um, so if this is a, a percentage of the overall hash rate which you possess, yeah, for example, one uh, two millionth of the hash rate, then you would have, um, or if you have three percent of the hash rate, you know, 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0.3 percent of the hash rate, uh, and over a year, so many blocks are uh, um, produced. Um, so uh, the number of blocks proposed per year. So it would be 365 days, 24 hours, and six blocks per, uh, per, per hour. Then you would have uh, uh, 25,560 blocks. And then multiplied by your probability to earn this, this would mean that you have only the chance of 0 0.0.158 blocks per year where you earn money. Yeah. And that's obviously not such a nice business. Yeah. So therefore, it's nicer for you to be member of a pool where you don't earn so much, like if you would mine a whole full block, um, but uh, you would have every month an income or every day or every week you would have some income. Um, so the hash rate itself is a stochastic variable uh, in the sense that if, if you look now at um, the number of hashes that have been necessary to solve the puzzle, uh, there's obviously an expected value, which is rather stable um, over time. But obviously, there are uh, cases when uh, in very early attempts, uh, the result has been found. And you also have cases where it took much longer than to find the result. Yeah? And this is shown here by this um, diagram, uh, so that the variable itself, more or less, is rather stable, yeah? with some uh, uh, changes here if, if miners leave or uh, the market goes down, whatever. But otherwise, it's a rather random uh, variable here. Um, we also, maybe I mentioned this uh, last week, um, so the network observes, let's say, how, how long it takes for finding the next block. Yeah, because um, if the hash rate goes up, the time goes down until the next block has been mined. And once the network realizes that uh, this happens over repeatedly, yeah, that uh, blocks are found very rapidly, the difficulty is automatically increased. Yeah, so this you see here that uh, the hash rate went up, 
and, it, uh, and then here you see these steps, the, the uh, difficulty. Uh, so that's the hash rate in the last 504 um, uh, blocks. And that's the hash rate in the last two, 2016 blocks. Yeah? And then if you look at this, uh, the difficulty gets adjusted. Uh, it, it goes up the whole time because the hash rate goes up. Yeah? So it follows more or less the hash rate with a certain delay. Yeah, uh, here, I think there was, no, it even went down here. So the, the uh, difficulty went down to go up again. Yeah, and so that's more or less a self-regulating system. Yeah, so that the system more or less is resistant to increases in hash rate. Um, um, and also, if now people would leave the network or maybe the China would ban Bitcoin mining, uh, the hash rate would go rapidly down, but also the difficulty would go rapidly down so that uh, the profitability of doing um, hashing for the rem remaining people would go back to this level. Okay, and this is a linear scale, maybe that's important to see. Um, okay, um, I think that was what I wanted to explain here for the difficulty of Bitcoin um, 